Hi, good morning. It is a good morning, even though the uh, Bond party last night left its mark, I think it's fair to say. Um, how are you all feeling? Did anyone go to the Bond party last night? Did you, everyone go? Yeah? Put your hand up if you went. Put your hand up if you regret how much of those cheap martinis you had. <laughs> good morning. Um, okay, so uh, on a serious note, just to kick off, um, not really related to the subject of the talk. I'd just like to point out that there's a talk later on today by Geet um, that I think most people should attend because this industry, this world is plagued by a certain epidemic that we don't recognize. And I myself have suffered very, very deeply with this. And that, that would be basically anything related to depression and anxiety. So um, there's a talk later on about depression, <laughs> which, which actually has a, a, you know, a positive note. Um, that you definitely should attend if you get a chance. Okay, so what do I do for a living? Um, I am a chief scientist, which means that people think I'm responsible, and actually in my head, I'm this guy. <laughs> Seriously. Um, or, or I am man. It varies, depending on how cool I feel. Um, but normally, I'm just this guy. So my job is to do the fun stuff. I've started several companies, and I enjoy starting companies, but I know when I'm not no longer useful to those companies. <laughs> so uh, I, I become the chief scientist as opposed to the CEO. It's that point at which you, you start to really hate Excel and numbers. Then you become a chief scientist because you just really can't bother with the rest of it. And uh, so I'm a chief scientist now of Simplicity itself. And that means I get to play with cool stuff. And it means you know, on a Friday evening in Copenhagen, I get a chance to code and go. Um, that's how cool I am. OK, so. <laughs> Um, just to start with a little story, I guess. Have you noticed how in films, when someone walks into a scene, they walk in through the door, they never forget what they were going to say, and just walk out again. Go, oh, I did it. And yet, we do that all the time, right? So you get up off the couch, and you go, I, there was a reason. I got up off the couch. There was definitely something I was supposed to be doing, and it was important at the time. And yet, I can't remember it at all. That is common in human nature, but you'll never see a agile evangelist forget why you should do something. There's always an answer in a book somewhere, or one of their books usually. Um, you know, the answer is on page 34, and you should do this. There's a recipe for everything, and. I feel that um, this talk, if anything else, should actually make you feel a little bit more like Dory and make you feel that actually the answer isn't out there and I'm going to have to think for myself. OK, so a slight confession to begin with. I am a recovering Agileista. I have been for many years now, and I'm loving the fact this stage is so big, I just keep walking. Pretty, pretty really upsetting the guy of the camera there. Um, <laughs> but, um, I'm a recovering agileista in the sense that for many years, I was one of those guys that would tell you to do X, Y, and Z, and everything will be better. And unfortunately, what I found more often than not is that what I was saying was entirely wrong, or in some sense, didn't meet the context well. And the, I pondered this. As a chief scientist, I can ponder a lot. So my ponderings went along the lines of why am I telling people to do these things when I don't really know myself? And there's an urge to know, right? So if anyone has ever been a, who's been a consultant in the room, who label themselves as a consultant? OK. It's, it's, it's one of those confessional type things. <laughs> as a consultant, you're, you're urged to know the answer <laughs> more, the, more often than you actually know it. And uh, as a cons by the way, that, that is my definition of consultant versus coach. A coach will help you find the answer, whereas a consultant just says it's X, do it. And that's what you pay them for. And so for many years, I was paid to tell people the answer was X when it was probably X with a number of deltas along the way. So that's my confession. I don't always have the answer. And when I work with companies now, the, the interesting thing is I don't usually have the answer yet until I meet you. OK. So what is the Agile hangover? Now, the Agile hangover has been, and it's particularly pertinent this morning, um, the, 
the, the Agile Hangover is not what you may have heard of in the past. There's a lot of craftsmen out there that use the Agile Hangover as a phrase that then leads to why you should do craft, which might well be correct but for you, but the, I don't know if it's correct for you. So my point is that you know, the Agile Hangover is something I'm noticing more and more in different organizations, and it's a feeling that comes through, right? So there's a there's a almost a desperation. It's a desperation that's been led by the fact they're on this edge. Okay? They are desperate to know what next. Where should I put my foot next? And I particularly like this picture because I don't know where your foot should go next. <laughs> um, elegantly speaking, you know, you could you could easily put a foot anywhere and it would be wrong. Um, there's a lot of companies that spent a lot of money on becoming agile in some sense. And now they're wondering why. And so this talk is a little bit about that. Okay, so why have we done this? Why have we got here? Where do we go next? And hopefully I'll give you a few tools to go forward with beyond the cliff. Okay, but to do that, I need to tell you a story. I need to tell you what I started from. And uh, this is, uh, this is, I've not told this story before on stage. Okay, this is, well, apart from last week, Copenhagen. <laughs> but I've not told it before in front of a camera. Um, so back in the day, right, I used to work on these horrific machines. I was basically software developing for blinky lights. If it could blink, I probably wrote it. Now, <laughs> writing this software was fairly straightforward, but even in that, in that, in that context, uh, we managed to screw it up beautifully several times. Um, I worked on, th this machine here is a Calder. That's British engineering, by the way. Not, not just English, but British engineering. Um, we built these machines. That machine, there, that doesn't give you an idea of the size of the thing, right? So that they, I, last week I said it was the size of the room I was in. That would be a lie to this week. <laughs> but uh, essentially, it would be probably the size of this stage. And the idea of this machine was it was a batch processor, so it would run all night, and you'd send your photos in, your film, that's how old I am. You'd send your film in overnight, and you trust them to, to process it on one of these beasts. But this beast had certain problems, right? So one of the problems it had was that the motor that drove all that film through it, like 10,000 films would go through this thing, that motor warmed up, all right? The, the oil in it would get warmer, and therefore the motor would run faster. So I wrote a piece of software that equally had to be encased in such a machine. Uh, ultimately, if you ever open one of these things, it'd be a tiny little computer at the bottom, and then there'd be like loads of space, and then this really massive stainless steel box around it. And the idea of this machine, the, the software I wrote anyway, was to keep that motor running right. You know, readjust its speed so that your film didn't go through the bath at the incorrect speed, which is really important to you. Because otherwise, you get those. Do you remember, I don't know if you get them in Denmark, but you, in, certainly in the UK, we used to get these little stickers that said that, you know, it used to be quite sarcastic. It would say, You screwed up. You took a bad photo, but we did our best to make it okay. But maybe you should go and get some schooling on this. And, and that's what it would say. It was very patronizing. And we get these stickers. Now, in truth, what those stickers are really saying is, <clears throat> at, but when we processed it, we screwed up. <laughs> we didn't do the right thing. And I know this because um, when we first turned this machine I worked on, when we first turned it on, uh, it was supposed to control the motor, which it did. Um, but it slowed it down quite considerably. <laughs> and. Uh, and effectively over devved about 10,000 sets of films. And they all got a little sticker and said, maybe you should take better photos. Um, no, that was a confession. That's my fault. So working on these machines was interesting in the sense that when I was working with the company, I was, first of all, I was working with a psychopath anyway, um, a lovely guy called Darren, who I think he made a living from hurting me, was the way it worked. And essentially, there was no version control. There was absolutely no process whatsoever. There was utter chaos. And even to the point where we managed to destroy a circuit board because we didn't know if the machine was on or off. 
<laughs> when someone unplugged the circuit board. I've never seen an arc of electricity so impressive as someone ripping a circuit board out and goes, Psh, no idea. So we were going through a version of hell. And what I didn't realize, which, which retrospect has given me, right? So I can look at this and go, actually, <laughs> I was learning what the industry was learning. This was chaos. This was utter pain. This was essentially a crisis in microcosm. I was doing everything that everyone else was doing wrong all the time. And so I did what any professional software developer will do in this position. I moved on. <laughs> I changed my job. <laughs> yeah, you don't, fix, you don't fix the problem, you move on. Um, it's, it's like a lot of us do, right? So we create some software that everyone else calls legacy after we've left. <laughs> um, so I moved on. And I moved on to a different type of device, right? So I'd worked with these big, blinky light boxes. And I thought, what I want to do is work with more impressive, big, blinky light boxes. So I started working on fast jets, uh, which was a bit of a jump. Uh, Career-wise, I don't think there's many pilots that would be impressed with my choice of jump <laughs> to go from photo processing machines to fast jets. But it was fun, right? And, and that's actually one of the ones I worked on. Um, it's the F-16, and it's got the pod underneath is, is one of the things I worked on, and occasionally it worked. Um, what it would do is record lots of imagery as this fast jet did its fast jet thing, and at some point, someone might look at that imagery, and then they realize they captured far too much imagery that if they actually human watched it, then they'd want to kill themselves. So what happened was it uh, kind of retrograded to, can we detect objects like a tank? Can we did, uh, I think back then it was like, can we detect a scud launcher or something? And, um, and it was fun. And when I joined this next job, I was looking for a certain set of characteristics, I'll be honest, because I come from the chaos. And I wanted to know that I was going to a better thing. And when I went for an interview, this is kind of the, the guy I met. Not Mourinho, but essentially the same look. Um, I walked into my interview, and he basically, this guy turned around and said, we know how to do software. And I thought, wow, brilliant. Bear in mind, this is 16 years ago. Um, I'm sitting there going, fantastic. And if he did, if he was right, can you imagine what this industry has gone, the roots this has gone down? We're still trying to figure out what we do. He knew back then, he was, if he was right. Um, and he definitely believed he was right. And he said, we, we, do, we know, we know how to do this, right? So we have, we do nine month projects. That, that sounded good to me. Everything I've worked on before was basically continuous delivery in the sense that we continuously delivered what people didn't want. And um, he said, you know, nine months, and uh, then we drop, and they, every time, on time to budget. Oh, good, we're good. And then came the, the punch, and I was naive enough not to know or to smell a rat in this case, right? He turned around and said, actually, eight months is spent designing. Oh, not just designing, right? This was early days in a wonderful scenario where we had this thing called Rational Rose. I can tell by the sniggers that people have met this beast. I was an early beta tester for it, and I apologize for that too, because I don't know what I was testing. I was just doing something that someone else told me to do. And we were trying to design our software with diagrams, and essentially what the guy was saying is, literally, you spend basically eight months drawing diagrams. And then, after that, and we do this because very smart people have told us to, <laughs> right? There's some incredibly smart, they, their genius is out there, right, on a mountaintop. I always envisioned them on a mountaintop. And if you ever see Grady Booch, he looks like he should be on a mountaintop. Um, the, these people were out there and they were, they were gonna tell us how to do it. And so this was my first introduction to dogma and people know the right answer, and I don't. And I, okay, so there's these amazing people. And the story continued in this interview with this guy. He basically said, what happens is, we do eight months of design, because these guys tell us to do so. And then, and literally, I kid you not, the physicality of what he did next was interesting. What he did was he said, then we just write the code. And he's basically just 
grinding the gears on a music box so the monkeys can write some code. And that was how it was vision, envisioned. That was perfection. Eight months of thinking, designing, because the smart people told us to do that. And then one month of just write the code. Come on, it's the easy part, surely. <laughs> um, so I listened, and I believed. And I became very caught up in what this guy was saying. And I, I, I wanted an answer anyway. I think like most of us in the industry, we really wanted an answer. And it was better than before. Okay, there wasn't people managing to cause massive lightning strikes by ripping things out of machines because they didn't know the machine was on. And that, you know, we didn't lose as much code. But what I did realize also is that most of the time we didn't ship anything either. Um, I think in the eight years I spent in this organization, um, we shipped something probably three, three times, which for anyone's math, is not every nine months. Um, but, you know, it was better than before because I felt a good safety net around me. And so, like every professional software developer, I did the right thing. I moved on. <laughs> because I'd heard this is cool thing out there, right? I, thought, I heard others were, um, were, were smart. There were, there were other smart people beyond the three amigos. There was someone else that was also equally clever. And there was a whole group of them. Brilliant. So there was this manifesto that I believed in. That was great. I still do. It's a great set of uh, things to live by when you're writing software and exploring problem domains. And I wanted to be part of a company that was doing that. But when I joined other companies that were doing this, what I realized is there's an awful lot of arguments around process. There were these strange discussions of, are you Kanban? Or are you scrum? Or are you something else? And therefore not agile anymore. And I found that fascinating. Because everyone seemed to forget what we were actually doing, which was building stuff <laughs> and actually trying to ship it. And maybe I was naive. You know, maybe I'd still got this you know, strange, I don't know, past experience from being in the chaos and actually delivering software that people wanted even if it didn't work. Um, but what I realized is we were fighting over some strange oddities. We were fighting over how to organize the work that we were doing. But we were being sold it in a very different way. Who here has been sold ag agile on the basis of hyper-productive teams? You'd be hyper. Oh, there's some hands. Got Thank you very much for being honest. Uh, it's the hyper thing, right? If you look at the definition of hyper, it's not usually considered a good thing. Um, it's a system that's stressing itself out to the point where it might just collapse. <laughs> okay? If you're hyper, usually it's an indication you want to turn it down. So hyper productivity was one thing. Everyone was sold different things. No process that I'm aware of actually does this, produces speed. Okay? Speed comes from the people involved in the process. And so we were sold a really good line on the basis of some fantastic values in the manifesto and some fantastic principles. Um, we also did a wonderful job, as we do in this industry, right? So we don't go away, we don't think about stuff. What we do is we steal. We go and find someone else who's done something similar and go, oh, yeah, that, that's related to our thing. And then we go and make up these terms, or we use these terms in a sort of jargon-specific way. And I'm guilty of this as well. And so that, that, honestly, it, what, you don't know about work, you know, work in progress? Whip. Are you doing whip? Whip is the thing. And it, do you know what? We buy into that because we definitely want a right answer. And so we've stolen whip from other places. And it's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. But we're still messing around, I think, a little bit with the process without, without focusing on what happens. And so what happened next, right? So in the agile scheme of things, and I'm guilty of this fundamentally, is money was introduced. Lots of money. <laughs> Masses of money. If you don't know who this is, I do apologize. It's a very British joke, this one. Um, this, this guy was one of the comedian's very first early characters. And he really didn't do much other than say he had lots of money. And it was the 80s, so lots of money was considered a good thing. So yeah, we spent thunderous amounts of money on changing our process and changing 
you know, the mechanics of how we ship things without realizing that there's one thing we, we should be spending money on, but we're not. And I'll get to that in a bit. Okay, so wherever there's thunderous amounts of money being spent, there are consultants. <laughs> and I was one of those. <laughs> and when consultants turn up, um, or coaches, they're a very similar looking breed. The, what we do is we turn up and we go, I've got the answer. But I'm that smart. I'm going to have to explain it to you slowly over the next few months whilst you continue to pay my day rate. And so in the agile terms, this is what leads us towards the hangover is that we, we actually spent a huge amount of money and time on consultants and coaches to make ourselves better. And it got a little bit better. We felt a little bit good. Okay, We felt that we'd done something. And actually, we have. We've come a heck of a long way. So this, this slide set, this talk, could be considered a little bit uh, negative without me going back and telling you how bad things were in the beginning. And so things were better. But that leads me to where we are now. And I, I work with a lot of companies where they've, they feel better about what they're doing, but they want to know what's next. And it's a little bit of a depressing answer for consultants. Because I'm not sure they'll ever come from a specific individual or anyone who has the platform of a stage, actually. So we're on this cliff edge. And what we need to realize is a fundamental law of software development. Um, and it's a little uncomfortable, because it actually flies against our philosophical underpinnings in software, particularly our philosophical underpinnings and the basis of everything we do. As, as geeks, as a geek myself, we believe we know what we're doing, and that's wrong. So the first law of software development, I believe, should be we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> Haven't got a clue, honestly. Whenever someone says, and I've been there, where someone says, we're going to build another one of those, but with a few changes, that last part of the sentence is critical. OK, we don't know what we're doing. We have no clue. We are going to discover, explore the answer with you collaboratively. But whenever someone approaches a software development department or team or IT or whatever they want to label things as, they'll often approach it with, do this thing. And the answer is, we don't know how to do it yet. We can make plans, and we should make plans, but we don't know what we're doing. And if we can accept that, it fundamentally moves our thinking into a different direction. It actually takes us back to what Agile was supposed to be about, which is adaptability. We don't know what we're doing, so we're going to have to figure it out. If we make a plan, yeah, it's going to change. Um, and so, in fact, we don't know what we're doing. It's a good thing. We know that. Everyone in software development knows we don't know what we're doing. And you know, they feel kind of comfortable in saying it might be like something we did before. But we really don't know. And we're going to explore it. OK, so when you take that message, what happens is all the money being spent on different ways of working and processes, it, became, it, becomes, it puts it in at least a place. You can understand it. You can go, people are arguing and fighting over how we work. But in, in essence, what we're trying to do is deal with the fact that we are exploring a system that we don't know yet. And all of these ways of working are essentially giving us a comfort buffer against this fact, this uncomfortable fact that we don't know what we're doing yet. OK, so other factors in the story of the Agile hangover. We've there's been a few mentions of this yesterday, but I want to just bring it to the head, is this idea of introversion. Now, intro introverted or not, or the spectrum of introversion towards extroversion, is a gross summary of character traits. Pretty well proven, um, particularly in psychology, where a lot of things aren't proven. Has anyone read Freud? Oh my god. He's making that stuff up, wasn't he? Um, but yeah, you've got introversion to extroversion, which is fairly proven scientifically. And the idea here is 
we are at least made up of an industry where 50% of the people are introverted in some sense. And so just a, a quick poll, and please don't be embarrassed. It's not a problem if you are introverted, because I am. Um, can you raise your hands if you believe yourself to be introverted in some sense? Hey, look at that. That's good. That's good that you're aware. Most of the speakers are, by the way, which is ironic, don't you think? We're introverted, but we stand on this spotlight. And these spotlights are pretty bright, too. Um, we stand here, and we do this. Do you know how I get through doing talks as an introvert? Um, not just the sufficient amount of alcohol that I consumed last night. The, the fact is, I'm talking to one person. Yes, there's a lot of people out there, and you've managed to achieve a wonderful scatter graph around the room. But there's lots of people out there, but I don't, I don't know you're there. I'm talking to one person, or I'm talking to you, sir, or I'm talking to you, madam. I'm, I'm talking to one. Because introverts love one-to-one -one conversations. We're rubbish in pies. And um, the interesting thing is that most of the agile practices where I see people who are complaining about this agile hangover situation, the agile practices fight against introversion. They assume that everything is done collaboratively. Intro introverts don't want that. Introverts would really like to go and work on the problem themselves and then come back and possibly talk through a mediator <laughs> to, to give you the answer. So I, I've worked with a lot of teams where they, they, we've got a problem person, not a team player. He's not doing the right thing. Sorry. He's just not one of us. I, and I've actually heard the horrible phrase, I don't think he's going to make it. It's not like he's going to die. I, he won't die. I'm going to guarantee you this. He'll go and find another job. But, the, you know, he's a very smart person. We love this guy. But when it comes to the agile thing, he's not on board. And almost bar none, it comes down to the fact this person is an introvert and wants to go and think about problems alone and then come and bring, find some mechanism to bring some answers back. And I just would like us to realize this, that, you know, the dogma and the, uh, the authorities in some respect, would have us believe that the right way to approach agile development is all team-based, and it's not. We work in an industry where essentially what we're doing is an intellectual endeavor. All right? that, that makes us feel good about it. Okay, well, I think, therefore I am. Okay, this is what we do, and actually what we're doing is research and development. Not just development, but research and development. Now, if you don't understand that a number of your people are introverts, the way they explore a problem space, the way I explore a problem space, is not always collaboratively. So a quick straw poll. Where do you think software development happens? You know, does it, does it happen when someone's typing? Or does it happen elsewhere? For me, it happens in the shower, which is not a collaborative experience. <laughs> Usually. Uh, it, <laughs> very, very rarely it would be. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not the place where you expect your team to turn up. Um, in the shower, or going for a walk, quietly, on my own. Um, this has put me in conflict with a number of employers, <laughs> where uh, essentially what they would like me to do is just like write code. If you're not writing code, what the hell are you doing? Um, I'm thinking. That's what we do, is we think about stuff, and then we come back with some answers. And yeah. That now we've got this, these practices that say what you should be doing is at a whiteboard and with a pen in your hand and collaborating. Introverts aren't going to do that much either. Uh, they'll do it. I'll do it. I'm happy. I'm a very visual thinker, so I'm happy to draw. Introversion doesn't mean shy. It just means that I do my best work alone. And I do my best work when I'm relaxed and not putting energy into something. So an introvert essentially is someone who's putting energy into a situation like this where um, they feel uncomfortable. Um, and if you need a, a recipe to detect introversion, it's very simple. Um, yesterday, there was a book mentioned called Quiet. Uh, amazingly good book. Definitely read it. The interesting part of that, for me anyway, the takeaway from that was that we have this culture that ex extroversion is good, introversion is bad. And actually, it's not. It's not like that. So we shouldn't be looking to change introverts into extroverts. That's like telling someone who is homosexual, just sort yourself out. OK, Intro it's that deep, right? It's not a choice. It's not a choice to be introverted. It's deep, deep down, and you ain't going to change it. So 
when we're looking at the different practices we've got, and I see this with the Agile Hangover, is that we need to look at these different practices that we're employing and see how much we're hurting people with these practices. And the biggest pain that I've seen out there for introverts is the culture that suggests that we should always be pair programming. OK, I'm going to sacrifice a land now. Um, pair programming, who does pair programming at work? There's a few people that do. I'm unfortunate enough to work in, a, have worked in an organization where you have to pair programming to touch the code. That's how dogmatic it is. If you're not working with someone else, then don't touch. The problem with that is that an introvert will find that exhausting to pair program, because that's ongoing communication with another. And it's OK. It's, it's fairly boxed. As, a, as an introvert, that test I was telling you about, if you go to a party, if you instinctively try to have one-to-one -one conversations, you're trying to gravitate out of the room a little bit, that means you're probably on the scale towards introversion. If you're an extrovert, what you'll do is try to gather, because you're gaining energy from lots of people coming together. In pair programming, we do have one-to-one -one conversations, but it's still quite stressful. So if you're one of those people, like myself, that finds pair programming a little bit uncomfortable for extended durations, that's not wrong either. So anyone who mandates pair programming is the only way to go is hurting people. That's hurting 50%, at least 50% of your workforce. It's probably hurting about 70% of the speakers. OK, so just dogmatically applying these things doesn't work. There's another culture that I see in the agile hangover style organizations. And this works at the project management level. And this is the culture of keyboard clacking. OK, so who here is a project manager or works pretty much guiding a project. Let's call it that, right? Great. You have probably the best network of people in your organization, without a doubt. OK? The team doesn't want it. You've got it. So you're very valuable. Forget what everyone else says. Project management. I spoke to an individual um, who should remain nameless about six months ago. And he said the one mistake we made when we adopted agility, in some sense, was to basically take our project managers and shoot them. We just killed off this role. We killed off these people who cared about things very deeply. And he said, it's the biggest mistake because what we did was kill a network of friends. These people knew how to go into a meeting with, with other people and defend the project. We then put the team doing this, and the team went and did it. And my goodness, I've never seen such blood on the, in the water. So keyboard clacking, though is a disease that I've seen amongst a lot of organizations. And it's this idea, if you're, you're not working unless you can hear <laughs> pair up. You know, hitting the keyboard, working with the keyboard, I might be preaching to the convert here, but working with a keyboard, that's not where software development happens. That's an output. That's a last stage concern. And there are people out there that I've met, that if you're not at the keyboard doing something, then what the hell are you doing? What are you doing that's, that's different? Cool. OK. <laughs> I'm getting, getting a reminder of time, and I need to speed up. The other one is it's a, related to it, is that we now have a culture where we encourage keyboard ballet. Has anyone seen this, where they're trying to pair with someone, and I have no idea what he just did, or she just did? Seriously. It's like, <laughs> the change is made. What, what, what happened? <laughs> Honestly, I didn't see a screen yet. Um, I get the same experience when I watch people really experienced with an IDE. Okay, they're, they're, they've spent a lot of their life getting really good with the IDE. <sighs> what do you do? What did you just do? Because I haven't got a clue, and I'm the navigator. You know, that's like being a navigator on a ship where the ship has just gone through several oceans, and I haven't got a clue how it got there. And so this idea of keyboard ballet is also pervasive in our industry that you should, oh good, that's a, that's a correction. <laughs> I thought, literally a minute ago I had eight minutes, now I have 18. <laughs> okay, that feels better. Are you a project manager, Jess, really? <laughs> Do I actually have 25? Um, <laughs> okay, so 
Um, the other thing that I notice in Agile Hangover, and I have to tell a story to, to get this across, um, and I apologize if anyone's ever seen me speak before because I have told this story a fair bit, is that we forget what we're building needs to be as adaptable as we are. So I'm going to ask you to trust me, which is a bit of a step this morning, but if you could just trust me for a moment and close your eyes. I can't get to you, you're fine. Honestly, I'd have to run to get to you. If you just close your eyes. Trust the person you're sitting next to. Um, okay. It's sprint 10, and you're feeling good. Oh, you're feeling better than good. You're feeling brilliant. You walk in the morning, you've done the right thing. The software is looking beautiful. The process is glorious. And you sit there, and like anyone does in a stand-up, right? Anyone, any sensible individual in a stand-up will sit down. So you, you sit down, and you're in your stand-up, and you, after you've got the you know, inevitable status updates out of the way, um, the next step is usually one of, OK, so how are we doing? What are we blocking today? That sort of thing. So you're, but you're feeling good. And everyone around you is feeling good. And then what happens is the one thing we all dread. The product owner, or whoever makes significant decisions about what you're doing next, turns around and says that one phrase you've been dreading, which is, we want one small change. And at that point, you go through several emotions, very powerful emotions. The mo emotions include, first, Anger. How dare you tell me that things are going to ch change? No. We, we, we planned this two weeks. Come on. We, we, we know what we're doing. You want things to change? I hate you. I, if you're in Scrum, you've got a mechanism to deal with this. You can beat them up by saying, we'll cancel the sprint. We'll cancel it. And you're the problem. The next... The next emotion is more interesting in some respects. It's guilt. OK? We're guilty. Because deep down, we know we're supposed to be agile software developers. And agility, for those that know what it's all about, is about embracing change. And this was a change. And we're not embracing it. <laughs> in fact, we're going to try and use it to beat someone up. So, how agile are we really? We, we embrace change doesn't seem to be the thing. What's actually hanging around in the background that's in, in, taking us through these emotions is the elephant in the stand-up. I couldn't get people actually standing up, but it worked for me. Um, the elephant in the stand-up, as Rich Hickey would toy, coin it, is all the software that you wrote yesterday that's in conflict with today, or at least in conflict with that phrase, one small change. And it's not that the small change isn't small, right? So you, you should be looking, in this case, it's not, a, you know, it's not an education job, right? You're not turning around and going, actually, it's a big change. In fact, what you're looking at is it really should be a small change. I know it should be a small change, but it's not. And so we have phrases for this to deal with the elephant and stand up. What we do is we lie. Yeah, we lie. So, has anyone, and I won't ask you to put your hands up because this is kind of a crime, but um, oh, we need to do a couple of months of refactoring, or at least a few weeks. So what we're actually turning around to this change, it, we're saying we need to redesign. There is no refactoring that takes more than 10 minutes, but there's redesign that takes a lot longer because we need to redesign because the world has changed. And, but redesign sounds like we made a mistake. So redesign isn't easy to admit to. We have another phrase for it. We need to pay back some technical debt. I love that phrase, because it's basically turning around to the person who's asked for a change and saying it's your fault that we aren't right. I just want to make you realize that. So you're going to pay us back. Yeah, you're not going to get anything for the next two, three weeks, but, you know, now aware of the fact that you've made us make a mistake, you've pushed us too hard, therefore now you need to pay it back. 
So technical debt refactoring are often used as cloaks for the fact that we built the software in such a way that it's now in conflict with reality. And this is because our software hasn't kept up with agility. In these agile hangover organizations, the software is struggling. It's creaking. And it's creaking because we're platonic in our thinking. Okay. The reason I pull up Plato, it's, it's easy to criticize Plato because he's not alive now. Um, at least I don't think he is. Otherwise, that would be remarkable. Um, the lovely thing about Plato is that he had this idea of the perfect form. There's perfection out there, and we're striving towards it. Every project that is planned is brought into the platonic form, that there is the right answer, and that we are aiming for it. In true software, there's nothing like that. We, th there is no perfect form. We don't know what we're aiming for. It comes back to that thing. We don't know what we're doing. We're going to figure it out. Plato would have definitely been against that. <laughs> he would not have been a very pragmatic individual. Um, I'll skip Heraclitus because it just gets, it's just an extension of the point. But because we don't know what we're doing, the platonic form doesn't work. Now, the waterfall method, this idea of you do something, you do something, everything goes great in sequence, is brought into Plato. Okay, this, this idea that we know what we're doing. We're going in the right direction. And we might adjust a touch, but we know we're going to know what we're doing. And we don't have a clue what we're doing. So what we need to do is adopt a different philosophy when it comes to software development. And that philosophy underpins agility. I think it's a tragedy that it's not mentioned more than it should, you know, as much as it should be, um, which is stoicism. We should be reacting. Does anyone, does anyone know Seneca, the younger, the philosopher? Oh, wow. Okay. If you don't read his stuff, it's quite good. Um, Seneca's favorite, my favorite phrase of Seneca's is that we don't know, the next day is not promised you, which is pretty depressing as a basis for a philosophy, but the next day is not promised you. In fact, I won't even promise you the next hour. We don't know what's going to happen. This is fundamental to software development when we know it's research and development, because we don't know what's going to happen next. And our software needs to appreciate that we don't know what's going to happen next. So how many people, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but when you're working with software, how many people recognize, at least think, I don't know what's going to happen next? Okay? Now, I'm not saying over-design it so that we can appreciate every change that comes along, but we don't know how this thing is going to be changed. We really don't know. So we need to think about our software in such a way that appreciates we don't know what's going to happen next. Okay, so at this point in my career, going back to the story, um, I was looking for any answer, literally any answer. And what I found was what we don't need to get out of the agile hangover is another manifesto. We don't need another revolution. We don't need another set of values. We have perfectly good values and principles. But we do need to remind ourselves that we should be Stoics. We don't know what's going to happen next. And we should get out of this practice of believing that everything we do right now is going to be right forever. So I'm kind of popularized online because I, I basically say, no, 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 absolutely not. We don't need another manifesto. We don't, we don't need, a, a ma seriously, a manifest no. Um, but where is our savior? Okay, in the past, I had the three amigos. Then I had these incredibly smart people that went to a ski resort at the wrong time of year and came up with something. Um, there was always these geniuses out there that would tell us what to do. And wasn't life good? It's nice when people tell us what to do. For two reasons. We get an answer, and we get a blame. Um, it's beautiful. So where's the answer going to come from? Now, I have to pick on people. And then, unfortunately, some of these people are not here. In fact, neither of them are, so they can't beat me up. But is the answer going to come from, who knows this guy? Hey, who is he? Come on. Shout it out. Dan. Dan the man north, right? Is the answer going to come from Dan? Probably not. I mean, technically, some good answers will, but some good ideas will more than anything else. Um, but it probably won't come from Dan. Sorry, Dan. Um, will it come from this guy? Oh, who's this? 
Do you want to know who that is? Wow. Yeah, we've got a few. Who, who's it? Uncle Bob, right? Is the answer going to come from him? There will be lots of answers. <laughs> He's quite opinionated about those answers. But no, your answer won't come from him at all. Um, in fact, technically, <laughs> it won't come from anyone at the conference <laughs> that's speaking. Your answer won't. What we need to get our heads around is that anyone on a stage is only giving you decon decontextualized information. Okay, we're giving you some ideas that we've experienced that were useful in other contexts. And so the answer isn't even going to come from me. And you should never trust a guy on a Harley anyway. All right, and that, that is the bike that's waiting for me when I get home as well. Um, but, you know, it's not even going to come from me. What I'm trying to help you do is look at everything that comes your way and rationalize about it. Think about it, see how it contextually sits with your world. So with this philosophical start point of being stoic, everything you've heard in this conference, reevaluate and see, does it approach my context? Because no one on stage knows your context at all. I haven't got a clue. I'd love to find out, but I haven't got a clue. So it's not going to come from us. <laughs> and we are sorry about that. But what remedies could we offer, right? So this would be a pretty poor presentation if all I did was say, sorry, we haven't got a clue what we're doing. Good luck. Um, <laughs> we want to offer some sort of medicine to this. And the medicine really could be summed as being think. Um, I particularly love this philosopher, uh, Bertram Russell. He, awesome philosopher. If you haven't read philosophy at all, then try and read something he wrote. And when you wake up, it'll be great. Um, his point, though, was that we need to think more. And I think that's the message for the industry, is that no one knows your context. No one knows the people involved. It's a complex system. It's chaotic. I, anything I say on stage or anything anyone else says on stage will lead you towards a hangover of some form. It's going to lead you towards, we, you know, if you take this as rote, go do it. It might work or it might not. And every book that's ever written, I've got my brother-in-law, Adam, right? Terrific man. He believes what he reads. And so does our industry. Do you know how easy it is to write something? <laughs> I've written three books. One of them on UML. I'm sorry. Um, but, and one of them is actually for sale out there, which is great. Um, but the, you know, when you write a book, in fact, if you look in that book, I'm going to do myself a disservice now, but in that book, it's a bit out of date, <laughs> you know? It talks a lot, it's a very complicated algorithm for figuring out story points. Don't use it. <laughs> Honestly, it's ridiculous. But we had to come up with something at the time. It was a long time ago. The same with everything. Be very dubious of what you read. Be very dubious of what you hear on stage. We don't have the answers. We have ideas. And we should be more honest about telling you that. Um, do not respect my authority. <laughs> I'm on stage because I can deal with it, and I got invited, and I'm partially on stage because I got told to be here, and I got woken up about 10. So, but don't expect my authority. Right? I don't know what your situation is. I don't, I could give you suggestions, but please don't just do it. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, you're discovering your situation, your context. I don't even know where to start with it. So respecting my authority is probably not the right place to begin. Um, very much be aggressive against dogma. If someone tells you it's the answer, it's the right answer, it's not, usually. Um, it's probably dubious at best. And uh, be, be slightly frightened of evangelists that tell you, absolutely, it's the best thing ever. Oh my God, if you're not doing that, you're not this. Oh, it's amazing. Okay, this, by the way, this guy here, if you don't know who he is, he single-handedly destroyed the music industry in the UK. And he's working on the US, which is a beautiful thing. Um, essentially, anyone who is glazed up and really, really passionate, just calm them down. Bertram Russell would sit there in his big armchair and go, let's talk about this. We should do that more. Okay. You have the answers, not us. 
Your context is king. If you're not in an organization that is, in some sense, agile or adaptable to customer needs, it will be eventually because it will need to compete and innovate. You can't force these things. A lot of people go into organizations, and I, I've, I've worked with people who consider themselves to be disruptors. I'm a disruptor. They drop in, and they go, boom, and everything changes. Well, actually, what happens is, boom, it's like throwing a rock into a pond. Boom, lots of ripples, and eventually it calms down, and everything goes back the way it was. So it, change happens really slowly. And only you know what is the right change for your company, for your team, for your environment. And the downside is that thinking is really hard. Okay, unfortunately, the answer is not going to come from a book. Ideas might, answers don't. That requires you to think an awful lot. And we are lucky because we work in an industry where we are intellectuals. That used to be a a criticism, by the way. Intellectual was a, a phrase um, made up for someone that basically wasn't doing, you know, w was not involved in industry properly. Intellectual used to be a game. Okay, so what gets us across, what gets us past this hangover? What gets us past the agile hangover? A set of principles. Things I want you to consider. I'm going to go through these quickly. First one is anti fragility. If you haven't read anything on anti-fragility, please do. You'll have to get past a lot of verbiage. There's a lot of stuff written about this. Anti-fragility is kind of pragmatic stoicism. It says, we don't know what we're doing. We need to build systems that not just embrace change, but thrive on it. We want to change. Organic systems are already like this, right? So anyone here who's not been to the gym for a year knows what I'm talking about. After not going to the gym for a year, muscles don't look so good, right? They need stress. They need to be stressed. Modern life doesn't stress our muscles much, so the gym helps with that. Um, essentially, our systems and our software should be the same. And it's on a spectrum, OK? We all know what fragile software looks like. Has anyone done an update to Windows and then rebooted and gone, well, please, 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 please start it? That's fragility. Um, robustness <laughs> is usually along the lines of, you know, or I ask people in the UK, what's the first thing you do when you get a new broadband connection? What, they, they ping Google or they ping BBC. What they're saying is we trust those systems to be more robust than our own hardware. <laughs> and so that's robust. But that's not the end game. The end game is anti-fragility because in anti-fragile software and processes, we want change. We want new ideas. Bring it on because every new idea will improve what we're doing, or could improve. But we need a way of navigating that. And the idea is we need stress. Okay? Whether it's a human system or a software system, and there was a slide change there, by the way. It doesn't really matter. It's the same principles. So drop dogma. It lacks context. You have the context. You are the smartest people in this room about your problem space, easily. Okay. Anyone on stage has no idea. We're the dumbest people in the room when it comes to your problem. You can make this happen. Let's give you some tools to do so, because thinking's hard, right? OK, so the first thing you need to think about is, what questions are we going to answer? What do we need? What, any tool should do two things. It should give us answers, and it should ask questions. OK, it should for drive us towards questions. One of the ones that I particularly love is impact mapping. It's a very simple tool. If you haven't encountered it, please go and look at it. It's a tool for helping you build roadmaps rather than roads. What it does is identify options. It identifies ways of getting to a goal. If anyone's been in project management where it's gone, you know, when you, when you build the chart and you go, right, this, 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 win. That's not going to happen. Um, that is the opposite of what we actually need to do. We need to explore where we're going. So impact mapping is an alternative for steering where we need to go. The other one that to leave you with is it Real Options. If you haven't looked at Real Options, it's a great book called Commitment. It's a graphic novel. Do not let that put you off. It's a brilliant book. 
What it's trying to help you do is do what traders do. And yeah, okay, traders have got a bad rep recently. But essentially what they're doing is understanding that every choice we make is based on options available at the time, the options we've identified, and we're going to balance it. And we're going to look at that at some point we can't make the decision anymore because it's gone. But we know in this window that we can make a decision. And it might not be that we make the decision at the end. We should make it somewhere in the middle. So that's part of the game. But we also need to steer the ship through difficult waters. Systems thinking is another tool that people don't apply anywhere near it enough. The thing about systems thinking is every change you do to an organization or a team or even a code has secondary problems, right? Ter tertiary problems. Systems thinking helps you understand how that all glues together. So if you're not applying systems thinking enough, then what you're doing is tampering with the system. It's the difference between changing a system and tampering is systems thinking. Kinevin's the other one. If you haven't encountered this, then you should. And I'm going to be quite quick through this. I apologize, but the slides will be online, I'm sure. Um, the idea here is that depending on the characteristics of what you're working with, it'll have entirely different ways of approaching it. There's no good just applying dogma to a system that is chaotic, for example, where we can't see cause and effect at all. And that's that characteristic that you need to consider when you're considering change. OK, beating the elephant is the other thing. So we, we can manufacture our process to be more, be more agile and, and, and thrive on change. But if our software can't keep up, the thing we build can't keep up, then we're screwed. And I found that there was no tool for this in the industry that I've, I'd encountered. And I, so I created one, which I call the Life Preserver. The Life Preserver is purely a thinking tool for your software. It's a way of organizing your components, and it basically has a very simple premise, which is think about change. How decoupled should things be? Where should they sit? It's based upon the hexagonal architectural approach anyway, but in fact, it's just a, a very proactive, even collaborative, even if you're introverts, it works, um, tool for thinking through these things. So, of course, I encourage you to look at that, too. The other things that are out there that are important at the moment, and the reasons they're important, are this idea of microservices and reactive software as well. These things exist beyond the obvious characteristics that you see of these things. The important thing to take away is they're trying to help us build systems that thrive on change. That's the game. The next 10 years is about thriving on change and letting our software do that too. And that's where the reactive type thing sits too. It's all about thriving on change. There's some great other, I would call them secondary benefits. But the ultimate goal is we want to thrive on change. OK, so to take away, there's not going to be yet another authority. No one's going to tell you the right way on stage. No one's going to tell you that this is the absolute golden goal. It's not going to happen. It's your system. It's your software. Only you can change it. OK, what we're doing is throwing out ideas, contextualizing potential ideas. Anti-fragility is a different principle. It's a different way of viewing the world. It's a different way of dealing with your software. It's a different way of dealing with your people. So anti-fragility for me is the next thing after agility. In fact, it's almost a reminder of what we were aiming for. And there are plenty of tools. But there's one thing to leave you with. Why should we care? Why should we bother with this? The reason you should care beyond more anything else, and the reason I work with certain organizations that do care, is they are scared to death of organizations that have got this already. Okay, envy is a beautiful thing. And they envy something. They don't call it anti-fragility. They envy innovation. Because those that innovate are going to win. And it doesn't matter how big your organization is. It might be a very large organization, <coughs> Microsoft, that is struggling with innovation and change. We may all be part of organizations that have this challenge. So the reason we do this when we're talking to the business people 
please don't go to the business people and say, what we need is anti-fragility. They aren't going to get that. <laughs> they're not going to be interested. Tell them that we need innovation. They're on, they're on board. Okay, we need to innovate faster. We need to try things out more. We need to scale things out more. That's the selling point. And so thank you very much for your time. I apologize, I've gone a little bit over. Um, uh, of course, like most authors, I've got a book. Um, but it's about anti-fragility in organizations and software. And I will write more soon. So um, if you fancy that, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this venue. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of the conference through the lens of rationality and anti-fragility. You know your context. You're the experts. We're just throwing out ideas. Thank you very much.